good to be in the house of the Lord. I would like to uh, read from Second Chronicles chapter 34. We're going to read about a young kid who became king of Israel. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of of the Lord and walked in his in the ways of his father David he did not turn aside to the right hand or the left for in the eighth year of his reign while he was still young he began to seek the God of his father David and in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, the carved images, and the molded images. They break down the altars of Baals in his presence, and the incense altars were above them, he cut down, and the wooden images he carved, uh, the carved images and the molded images he broke in pieces and made them dust, dust of them and scattered it on the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priest on the altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. See, Israel fell into idolatry and because they had kings that were not uh, righteous, they worshiped Baal and the idols and other gods. Josiah came along and his heart was toward God and he purged Israel. And uh, we read about Jesus uh, in the New Testament when he cleansed in, cleansed the temple of the money changers. And I believe God wants to do a work in our heart. He wants, he wants us to purge out uh, vain images of him and worship God in spirit and truth. Heavenly Father, Lord in heaven, we praise your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we praise your name, we invite the Holy Spirit to inhabit our praises and cleanse our hearts of everything that's not of you. In Jesus' name, as we worship before your throne, amen.
Gotta find a key. Um, let's see.
Hallelujah. Well, Father, we do glorify your name. We magnify the matchless name of Jesus above every name in this place today. God, we're so grateful that once again we can dwell in the shelter of the Most High and rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, I declare that you are refuge here in this place. You're our fortress and you're our God and we trust you. You're our source. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us, that the enemy's plans will never prevail against us. You'll save us from everything he plans and from the deadly pestilence around about us. I thank you. You'll cover us with your presence. We find refuge and safety there. Your faithfulness will be our shield, our rampart, our protection, so we don't fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. We understand there may be a thousand that fall at our side and 10,000 at our right hand. But in your presence, we only stand and see with our eyes and observe the punishment of the wicked. We thank you, Lord, that when we come into your presence, we make the most high our dwelling place. We live there and no harm can uh, overtake, overtake us. No disaster will come near our homes. I thank you today that there are angels encamped around about our homes to protect us and to keep us. When we left there, you assigned angels to go with us and to go us to lift us up in their hands so that we don't strike our feet against the stone. I thank you that your church will always go forward. The gates of hell will never prevail against her. We praise you that around the world your message, uh, the message of the gospel is being shared and preached and people are coming to know you as Savior. I pray for a great move of your Holy Spirit in America that many will come to receive you as Lord and Savior. Today, once again, we stand in the gap, Lord, for this nation. We pray, Lord, that you you would move powerfully and mightily as we repent for the sins of this nation. I thank you for the turning to you that we sense here. We pray, Lord, that you would hear the cry and the call of your people that are standing in the gap called by your name, uh, praying, seeking your face, turning from our ways to your ways. I pray that you'd hear from heaven, forgive our sins, and heal our land. Again, we pray for our national, state, and local leaders, school boards, school administrators, uh, school boards and administrators, especially as we uh, get ready to go back to school. We pray, Lord, to be none of the masking or none of the COVID hype with the schools this year. We pray that you be with world leaders. We pray that you administer to them. We pray, Lord, that you would draw them out of darkness into the marvelous light. We pray for these leaders to come to the knowledge of the truth and, God, that you'd give them servants' hearts. If there are those that are intent on wicked and they're given to wicked and evil, I pray that you would remove them from their positions and their places of uh, uh, influence and I pray Lord that you would raise up a standard you said when the enemy comes in like a flood you raise up a standard against him I thank you for that today I thank you that when we walk with you we tread upon the lion and the cobra we thank you that we tread upon the great lion and the serpent I thank you that we have the privilege to walk in your presence because we love you with all of our heart mind body soul and strength we love one another as our as ourself we love one another as you love us your word declares that you will rescue us. We thank you, Lord, that because we acknowledge your name, you protect us. We acknowledge that the name of Jesus is the name above every name. In this house, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you today that you're always with us, that you never leave us nor forsake us. I praise you, Lord, that when demons hear your name, they tremble and flee. When we hear just the whisper of your name, we rejoice and praise. We thank you the name of Jesus is the only only name under heaven by which men, women, and children must be saved. And God, when we pray as we do today, we pray in the name of Jesus coming into the presence of the Most High, Almighty God, into the throne room of the Father. And God, when we come, Jesus has told us to ask everything in his name. You, Jesus, you said you'd ask the Father and he would give it to us. We're going to ask you for miracles. Thank you for the miracles you've already done, for the healings that have taken place. I thank you for lives that are being restored and renewed. I thank you, Lord, for those those that have hope, Lord, where there once was no hope. I thank you, Lord, for deliverance. I thank you, Lord, that you're continuing to move powerfully and mightily.
As we come and pray in the name of Jesus, I pray that every one of the prayer requests be heard and met. I thank you today, Lord, that when we call upon you, always answer us. When there's trouble, you deliver us with honor and power, displaying your power and bringing honor to your name. I thank you today that if we leave here because of our relationship with you, uh, with Jesus, we'll be satisfied with long life and eternity. But even while we're here, you'll always be our help and our salvation. And again, we thank you for the the table that has been prepared in the presence of our enemies for us today. I'm determined by the end of this day to leave nothing on that table. I thank you for this day, the day that you that will receive blessing, and God, we thank you. The day will honor you and lift your name up. It's a day you've made, never going to be another one like today. We'll rejoice and be glad in it and give you all the praise and the honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you love him, give him a great praise in this house today. But God's good. Amen. It's good to see Sherry online with us and um, uh, Gamal. It's always good to have you join us. Also good to have um, Judy Scanlon joining us from uh, uh, over in Evansburg, Pennsylvania. And Allie, it's good to see you online as well from Western Pennsylvania. Always good to have you join us. We thank the Lord for his faithfulness, his goodness. It's good to see all of you here today. And uh, um, we're going to take our offering, and we're going to go into a time of prayer. We're going to get into Revelations, the 11th chapter, here today. As you give, if you'd like to give online, you can do so by going to our website, hbgfirst.org, or going to our mobile app, Harrisburg First Assembly. Very easy to give on those venues. And so I encourage you to continue to be faithful to the Lord as we continue to uh, just live in his blessing. God is good. His blessings never run out. They're, his mercies are new every morning. And they're not determined by what's going on around about. It's determined by our faith in him and our obedience to him. So, Father, we thank you for this offering today. We thank you for the generosity of your people. I thank you, Lord, that you're always for us. I thank you, Lord, that as we release into your hands this offering today, use it to expand your kingdom, and God will give you the praise and the honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you in advance for your giving. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for those of you online that have been giving as well. We appreciate that very, very much. And um, we thank the Lord for all that he does. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. And um, I'm encouraging, uh, if you're able to join us in a time of prayer and fasting, August the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, I encourage you to uh, join us in that time, whether it's a meal a day, whether you fast that entire time, you fast from 6 to 6, uh, whatever the Lord lays upon your heart. Whatever you fast, spend that time in prayer. And specifically this month, I want to be praying for our children going back to school, that God would go before them. Uh, they don't need the nonsense of the last few years that they've gone through. And we are praying that God will give uh, just backbone to school boards and um, give them wisdom. And we'll thank the Lord for all that he's doing, all that he's ministering in. Anybody else you have a praise or a prayer request you want to make known? Anybody? Right here. Uh, Tom's got a mic. Gail has a praise or a prayer request. Remember, continue my pray for my daughter. She continues to walk in the faith that has made her whole. It's good to see Bill online with us as well. Thanks for joining us. Go ahead, Gail. Um, uh, last week I had asked for prayer for our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, son-in-law. So I wanted to let you know that surgery went well. Um, as it turned out, the doctor was absolutely right about the horrible pain he would be in because they removed um, like tissue back at the palate and he has stitches there and down in his throat and on the outside. And lo and behold, um, he seems to be confused from all the uh, pain medicine he's taken. So he came to our daughter and said about this tape that he had like on his chin and down into like the jaw area and asked her to help pull it off. And she said, no, that's what's holding you together. I mean, the surgeons always say, don't touch that. 
Well, the next day he came out of the shower and he had ripped it off. So she had to get um, butterfly bandages and put them back together again. But he's on a, a liquid diet for two weeks because of having all those stitches inside. So he just needs prayer to be able to deal with the pain that he has. Amen. Then I have a praise. Uh, Sunday, we had six in Sunday school. And after our regular lesson, I decided that I wanted to tell them about the prophets in the Bible and give them some background on that. And then we went to Ezekiel 38, and I told them that this prophecy is being fulfilled right now and what it means to them. And I was amazed at how interested they were in it. And, and we got such a good discussion from them. And I just praise the Lord. It makes you feel good, like Amen. you are doing something. Praise the Lord. Jerry and Gail teach the gemstone class. And, um, you know, we, we encourage, if you have some folks that would like to be a part of that, encourage them to come. Art has something back here. Hello, Myrna couldn't make it in today. She's not feeling very good, or we didn't make it last weekend either. It's kind of like a flu, but she just wore down, I guess. Mm -hmm. So pray for Myrna, and I'm doing fair. <laughs> so that's all I have to say, but take care of poor Myrna. She's not doing good, and she's down and out. Thank you. Amen. Pray for Myrna. Also, Art's going to turn 80 in a couple of days, so happy birthday in advance. And uh, I understand Doris is seven. I'm not going to say how old she is today. I might get in trouble. But uh, <laughs> it's her birthday today, so happy birthday. And uh, we appreciate each one of them. Go ahead. Yeah, about I, uh, most everyone knows I had uh, heart trouble about two years ago. And, uh, my heart went down to 20% function. Monday, I had a echocardiogram, and my heart's back to normal strength. Praise the Lord. 55 to 60%. Praise God. And uh, now um, I signed up to drive one of the church buses. Praise the Lord. Because I feel strong enough. Yeah, praise the Lord. We appreciate all of our drivers that are driving. Amen. Anybody else? You have a praise? Go ahead, Arlene. Hi, and thank you all for praying. I talked to my director and was asking them about sending the women to churches. Uh -huh. And he said, that's fine. He has some, men, so I'm going to write a mission and a vision and a mission statement to him mm -hmm. and then give him to him the plans that I had. But there are some pastors who are talking about now because so it won't be one church. But all the churches need to be involved. So I thank you for the prayers. I thank God for this church because prayer is open and that's what we need. And another thing, they're coming in but they're getting a uh, uh, prescription from the doctor to smoke marijuana, these vapes. Yeah. And they're going crazy with that in prison. <laughs> so please pray that the anointing of God would touch the hearts. Amen. And save them as well. Amen. Pray Amen. for all these ladies that God would minister to them. Marge has something back here. I want to continue to pray for John Myers. The Lord will continue to help him to improve. Ilson Reyes. Um, pray for uh, Howard Beaver, who has cancer. He'll be starting chemo Friday. Go ahead. Um, uh, Abel needs some prayer on Monday. Well, before that, too. But uh, he's having a heart operation on Monday. So uh, you can pray for him. Amen. Remember, Abe in prayer. The Lord will touch him. Anybody else? You have a praise or a prayer request you want to make known? Over here, Helen has something, Tom. Um, if you're able to stay, I think they've arranged for um, some cupcakes and ice cream for uh, our folks that are uh, 
celebrating birthdays today, so they'll uh, be available right outside the door when you leave. So make sure you get it. And uh, we thank the Lord for all of you. But we especially want to celebrate our birthday boys and girls. Tom Taylor also is going to turn 80-something. I don't know how old Tom is right now. He's not here today. Go ahead, Helen. Um, for my sister Joyce, she found she's been battling cancer for years. Uh, she'll have this, that. I think a lot of it comes from unforgiveness in her heart. But um, she found that she's very, very down because she's very tired, and she found another spot on her tongue that she might think might be cancerous. But she's, she's so deceived. She believes in Jesus, but she thinks that's all it is. She doesn't go to church. I can't really get a conversation going with her. So just pray for my sister. Amen. Remember Joyce, is that right? Also Kathy Ramper's sister, Judy, who's going for a CT scan today. Remember her in prayer. I continue to pray for my friend Whitley, that the Lord will continue to help him and uh, put people in his life that will be a, a blessing to him, and he'll be a blessing to them as well. Anybody else? you have a praise or prayer? My oldest son, Aaron, has been away from the Lord for a while, um, and he's going this coming month for a heart CT scan. He's been having all these different problems with his blood pressure and stuff all over the place. And I told him I was praying for him, but right now he's not really listening to that. But I'm praying that this will draw him back to the Lord. I'm just believing. I, I felt like the Lord recently was giving me like peace. It was like, Lord, I'm really, you know, I was like anxious about this because he's away from the Lord. And the Lord was just putting on my heart that, you know, he's going to use something mm -hmm. to draw him back. And I'm praying this is it. Amen. Let's remember Aaron in prayer, also remember Charlotte in prayer that the Lord would touch her. Um, Bob and Anita are not with us today, David and Shirley. Anybody else? You have a praise or a prayer request, Tom? Huh? What's that? Nightmares. Nightmares? Do you have them? Okay, we're going to pray for you. You don't, he's, he, you still have them? Yes. Oh, they're gone. Okay. Okay. Praise the Lord. Anybody else? Is there anybody online? If you have something online, I'd be glad to pray for you. Gene? All, the, all these birthdays, all these birthdays being, is that, is that okay? Yeah, oh, you're no, good. No, I got it. Yeah. All these birthdays being celebrated, but to have you all beat at 93. <laughs> and I hope and pray that every one of you will have a beautiful birthday and many more with the health and the strength God has given me. Amen. I do thank him and praise him for what he does for me, and I hope he does it over and above for you. In Jesus' name I pray that. Amen. Praise the Lord. You got a birthday blessing, all of you. Anybody else? Have anything you want to praise the Lord for? Prayer request. Go ahead, Jen. Online, uh, Sandy Anderson is praying. Ask us to pray for those who are um, coming down with COVID. Yeah. And then uh, for me personally, I've been having some um, health issues. So uh, prayers for uh, my shoulder and my feet and stuff. So. Okay, so remember Jen in prayer, also Sandy's request. Good to see Sandy online today. Thank you for joining us, Sandy. Anybody else? You have a praise or a prayer request? Anyone? If not, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Bill's not here. We'll pray for Bill as well. He's, uh, I believe, has a doctor's appointment. So no trivia today. Unless someone's full of trivia, you're welcome to share it with us. But uh, we're going to get into the Word pretty quickly here. So um, uh, God's, God's good to us. And I want to encourage you to think about people that don't know the Lord. We've got to get our focus on reaching as many people as we can as quickly as we can. Invite them to church. Invite them to whatever uh, you can. Remember, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames is coming up the end of September, 1st of October. And we still need help. If you can sign up, we'd love to have you to be a part of that. And you will be blessed by being a part of it as well. 
Uh, the prayer time is always a great time, an hour before every service, uh, Friday and Saturday when they come together, Friday evening, Saturday, much of that time is prayer and praise. Uh, we'll try to have a lot of the setup done beforehand and we spend more time focused on prayer and praise. And uh, we just want to see people come to know the Lord. Last week they had a great, um, great uh, response to invitations in the va Vacation Bible School at Faith into Action. Over 70 people made decisions for the Lord. We need to pray that they'll get into a church. We need to see the churches filling up in, uh, in this uh, this community. So I believe in God for that and asking God to move powerfully and mightily. Don't give up on anyone, someone that hasn't come to church for a while. Invite them because they're hearing the news, and if they have any understanding of end times, they know that we're coming closer and closer with each day. You know, um, earthquakes, rumors of wars, uh, the number of wars, the number of earthquakes are just intensifying in this time that we're living in natural disasters, all those kind of things, people talking about famine, uh, all those kind of things. And we need to encourage people to run into the ark of safety, to run into the presence of the Lord and uh, just surrender their lives to him. So, Father, we come before you and we come in the name of Jesus, the name that is lifted above every name, the name that is honored above every name, the name which every knee bows and every tongue confesses, and Jesus, you said that when we come, we should ask everything of the Father in your name. You'll ask him and he'll give it to us. Today, we're asking you to touch those who are in need. I'm asking you to touch Whitley's need today, Lord. I pray that you would just put people in his life, Lord, that he would not even anticipate, that people uh, that would not even be... Um, be thought about that you'll just minister to them we pray for sandy's request for those that are coming down with COVID, and i pray lord that they would all recover i pray lord that you would minister to them and i pray lord that you would just divinely touch them and strengthen them i pray lord that you would move powerfully in each and every one of our lives i pray that today your holy spirit would saturate this place and minister to us in a way that only you can we pray lord for gal and jerry's son-in-law god I pray that you'd help him to continue to recover from this procedure that he's had. We thank you for Alma being here with us, and we thank you for all that you've done for her. I thank you for touching John Myers and Ilson Reyes. I pray for Heather McLean today. Pray for our shut-ins, for Mary Robinson. I pray that you would touch her. And Nancy Dreyer. I pray for Jim Ott and Joe Bello. I pray for Heather McLean that you would minister in her life. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with my daughter Beth and Missy Kane. I pray that you would touch them. I pray that you would be with Betty and Roberta. I pray minister in their lives. And God, we pray for Howard Beaver today, Lord, that you would just minister a total healing in Howard's life. In Jesus' name, we praise you and we thank you for it. We thank you that you're faithful, that you're holy, you're righteous. There's no one like you. I pray for Joyce today. I pray, Lord, that first of all, that you would just draw Joyce closer to you, Lord. That you'd soften her heart. I pray, Lord, that any unforgiveness would be uh, left go, Lord, that there, there, you would just set her free from unforgiveness in Jesus' name. And I pray that you'd heal her from the cancer that she's experienced. I pray that be broken from her and be gone in Jesus' name. We thank you for everything that you do. I pray, Lord, for a touch in each and every body in this house today. Be with Bill as he's uh, gone to an appointment. I pray that you give him a good report. I pray for Abe, Lord, that you continue to touch him and minister to him. I pray for this procedure be quick, and I pray that it be um, uh, be very beneficial and effective, and I pray, Lord, it be the best these doctors have ever done. We thank you for all that you do and all that you accomplish. We praise you that you're always in full control. You're on the throne, and God, you take care of every need according to your riches and glory. I thank you, Lord, that we have no fear. I thank you that we walk in, the, in a spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. We thank you that you're always for us and never against us. We pray for Jen. I pray that you'd be with her shoulders, her feet. I thank you that you'd minister to her, send a word now and heal her. And God will thank you for it in Jesus' name. Thank you for touching Tommy. Continue to be with him and help him. And God will thank you for all that you do. God, we pray for souls to come into the kingdom of God. I pray for many to make a decision for Jesus before it's eternally too late. I pray, Lord, many of them are sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, 
aunts and uncles. Lord, I pray, Lord, bring them into the kingdom. I pray for every prodigal to come back, and Lord, we'll thank you for it. I pray for Aaron today. I pray that you would just not only touch him physically, touch him spiritually, Lord. I pray, Lord, not only for him, but for every prodigal son and daughter that has drifted from you, that they would run back into the kingdom. I pray for Myrna today, Lord, that you would touch Myrna. Whatever uh, she's experiencing, I pray that you would lift it from her, and God will thank you for your touch upon her and your hand upon her. We pray, Lord, for each and every one that has a need in this house. We'll thank you for all that you do and all that you accomplish. Father, we praise you for your goodness and mercies, and we give you the praise for who you are and all that you do in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, as we come into the Word today, we thank you that your Word is anointed. As we read the Scripture, it will stir in our hearts. But God, I thank you as well that you would anoint my lips once again to speak to this great group of people online and in this house. And God, we pray, Lord, that as we speak the word, that our ears would be open to receive the word, our, our, our minds be open to process this word, and our hearts be open to receive the word in a way that would change our lives in Jesus' name. I thank you for your protection today. I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that we can put full confidence in your word. We can walk in faith and not fear. And God, we are determined to do that in Jesus' name and give you the glory and the honor for all that you accomplish. We thank you for your blessings upon us. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've already accomplished. And God, help us to be ready for your soon return. And we give you the praise and the honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see Deb O'Brien online with us and Susie as well. Thank you guys for joining us. And uh, we praise the Lord for his faithfulness. Um, uh, Pastor Clinton in Liberia uh, sends greetings. He says that uh, our country, Liberia, celebrated her 175th anniversary yesterday. Um, and uh, they have... Uh, a project that they've started that we've helped to supply the windows and doors for. And he's thanking us for, for that as well. Um, it's amazing what people in places like Liberia are happy with. Um, he, sent, um, he sent me a, a picture of a block building that had been put up with a roof on it, and they were celebrating what God had given to them and they needed windows and doors to finish that project. Because of your faithfulness, we were able to send the finances to supply them with those windows and doors. And um, you know, you, you're giving, you know, you, you'll notice that we don't come to you and ask for special offerings because your faithfulness and your giving, whenever the need arises, we've been able to meet those needs and uh, we thank the Lord for his faithfulness. His, his goodness and mercies. God has been good to us. He blesses generosity. And um, he's looking always for conduits that he can allow his blessing to flow through. If you want to be blessed, then be a blessing because God's looking for the conduits that he can flow. He, he, he doesn't want us to be reservoirs. He wants us to be streams through which his blessings flow. So in order to be blessed, you may need to make a determination that I'm going to let blessing flow not only to me, but through me. And the blessing will never run out. Uh, you know, even if one stream dries up, God's got another resource that he's going to uh, use for you. But uh, always be generous in the things of the Lord. He's faithful, he's holy, he's righteous, and we thank the Lord for his goodness. We're in Revelations, the 11th chapter. Now, well, before we get started, since we've got so many birthday celebrations, it'd be appropriate for us to sing happy birthday, right? So let's sing happy birthday to Art and to, uh, to Doris, Tom Taylor. Anybody else having a birthday we missed? Um, a happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. We'll just give you a God bless you instead of your name. Art and Doris and Tom Taylor, uh, we celebrate with you. 
We thank you for the gifts that all of you are uh, to us and to the kingdom of God and uh, for all that God's given to us. Revelation is the 11th chapter. I believe we started into that chapter um, last week. Uh, John, we talked about, has given this scroll to eat and told that he would have to prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and, and kings. In Revelations 11, uh, verses 1 and 2, he said, I was, I was given then, John saying, I was given a reed and a measuring rod and told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshipers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it. Because it has been given to the Gentiles, they will trample on the holy city for 42 days. Now, most scholars, as we said last week, agree that the temple is most likely a symbol of the church. And the idea that we, and the understanding that we get from this, that there's protection around the church. God protects his church even in the most horrific times. And we're going to talk about two witnesses in this chapter that for 1,260 days, they were able to speak and nothing could touch them. Nothing was able to stop them. And it was, it's only in God's timing. You're not leaving this world only in God's timing if you're walking in the will of God. You understand that? Even if there's danger all around you, you're not leaving this world until God has appointed that day that you're leaving. That's why you need not fear COVID. You don't need to fear cancer. You don't need to fear all those things that are around about us. If we believe Psalm 91, that we pray every service, and, um, you know, let's not let that get old because we pray it so much. Let it be fresh every day to remind us that God is our protection, but there are two prerequisites that we need to be living in his presence, we need to be close in his presence, and we need to love him with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength. We need to love one another as well. So there's protection for the church. God will have a temple, a church, a people, a place that he's worshiped in the world till the end of time. God loves his church. And we talked about the fact that you are the temple of God. Your body is the temple of the living God. It's good for us to decide that we are going to be part of the church who makes God's glory their end, his word their rule, and all their, their acts, uh, their acts of, of worship. Everything we do needs to be an act of worship. And we, we need to make that decision that we are going to be the true worshipers uh, that will be protected through the, even the times of persecution. Um, you know, sometimes we, we talk about what the devil's doing more than we talk about the promises of God. I, under, I understand evil is getting worse, and that shouldn't, that shouldn't surprise us because the Bible told us in the last days evil will what? Uh, I, I know the King James says evil will wax worse. That means it will get worse. And that uh, men's hearts... Uh, you know, they'll, they'll just be failing them. Young men's hearts failing them for, for fear. How many, how many people that you know, anxiety is a word that we love in America today. We need to begin to understand the Bible says we should be anxious for nothing. Cast our cares upon him. For, why, why do we cast our cares upon him? Because he cares for us. I thought that Jessica did a great job in her illustration. When things are happening around about you, you just, you, you know, something's happening. You're just tossing it off to God. And that's a, a great illustration of casting your cares to the Lord. You know, this is something, God, I'm throwing it up to you. You need, you, this is something that I'm casting to you. You will take care of it. I know you will. And we need to have that kind of confidence and walk with the Lord. But that doesn't happen when you, you don't. Don't wait till you're in trouble to build faith. Faith needs to be built from the time 
you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And I don't know how many people give their lives to the Lord, especially in America, and they never get into a regular study of the Word of God, a regular time of reading, and we need to begin to understand your faith needs to be built. You don't get in the midst of a troublesome situation and say, God, give me faith. You've got to build that faith so no matter what you're walking through, you are not giving up. You're going forward. And there, it's never too late to begin to build your faith. It's never too late. Every one of us have faith. If you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not a question of whether you have faith or not. It's a question of whether you've activated that faith. And I am determined to have the faith activated. And I use the illustration many, many times. It's just like a debit card. If you get that debit card in the mail, it says you must call 1-800, you know, whatever, or else, you, you know, you've got the card, you've got the money in the bank. You can go to the debit machine and try to use it all you want but until you call that number on the back. You are, it's not activated. It's not a question of whether you have faith or not. Your faith must be activated. Whenever you are talking about everything that's wrong more than what God is doing right, it is, it, it is not faith, it is doubt. We're giving more, more advertisement to, to what's wrong than, our, than we are to what's right. We, we're not walking in faith. So true worshipers will be protected through persecution, but those who refuse to believe or turn to Christ are going to be destroyed. Uh, during this time of tribulation that we're talking about in chapter 11, uh, two witnesses resembling Moses and Elijah uh, will prophesy. Uh, I, I, you know, Moses, I, I love Moses. I look at Moses as being the supreme example of what a pastor should be like. He is, he is the model for every pastor. Elijah, I, you know, Elijah was a very, very powerful prophet of God. But for me, I, I, love, I love Elisha's ministry, the one that came after him. Elisha asked for a double portion of what was upon Elijah. But one of the things that I'm noticing more and more as I look at uh, Elisha, he was just simple, humble, but yet he was powerful in his faith that he had for God. He didn't do like, you know, put on great scenes or anything like that. He just spoke the word of God and believed that it would take place. He just, he just believed that God would take care of what was needed. And in Revelations, in Revelations 11, beginning with verse 3 now we're reading, they're speaking to John and uh, it says, and I will give power to my two witnesses. So as, we, as we've already read, John's measuring the temple, measuring the altar. Uh, the outer courts are going to be given to the Gentiles to trample. And we don't want to be on the outer fringes of the church in this day that we're living in. This is the time, if there ever was a time, to get in and press in as close to God as you can. You do not want to be on the fringes whenever that trumpet sounds. We want to be as close to him as possible. He says, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord on the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, Fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemy. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These two witnesses, they are going to be prophesying for basically three, three and a half years, right, is, is what that comes out to, and almost three and a half years. And they're going to be prophesying, and they're going to be speaking things that people don't want to hear. They're going to be prophesying the Word of God, and there's nothing that anyone can do to stop them. And if anyone tries to stop them, the Bible says a fire comes out of their mouth and destroys them. Can you, can you imagine living in that time? Can you, can you imagine these two prophets uh, 
some believe to be Moses, Elijah, resembling the two of them. And they're speaking the word of God. They're talking about repentance. They're talking about the fact that, you know, homosexuality is wrong. They're talking about the fact that abortion is wrong. And anyone that tries to shut them up, fire comes from their mouth and they are destroyed. And this is going on for three and a half years. For 1,260 days, they prophesy the word of the Lord and nothing can stop them. Verse 6 says, these men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have power to turn the waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. God is in control. God is always in control. And God has not lost control today. God is in control of everything that's going on. In the time of uh, this treading down, God kept, uh, in the time of this tribulation, there are two faithful witnesses. They're talking about the truth of his word. They're worshiping God. They're talking about how excellent God is. The number of these witnesses, it's small, yet it's enough because God simply needs a remnant to, to uh, be there. They prophesy in sackcloth, and it shows... Uh, the afflicted state that, uh, that they're in, the persecuted state, and deep sorrow for um, everything that they are prophesying against. There, there's, you know, God is not happy that people are going to miss eternity with him. He's not rejoicing in that. These two prophets are dressed in sackcloth, a sign of sorrow. And they're, they're not enjoying the prophecy that they're giving. They're not like, you know, you're all going to get what you deserve type thing. They're simply saying, this is the word of the Lord. And if you don't turn to him, you're going to miss eternity. They're supported during their, their work till it's done. When they had prophesied in sackcloth um, for 1260 days, Antichrist uh, comes on the scene wars against them with force and violence for a time. And when they finish their testimony, you see, when they finish their testimony, they are killed and they die in the streets. We're going to read that in just a moment. But nothing could touch them until God was finished with what he wanted to do. Nothing, you remember Jesus as he walked on planet earth. There would be a crowd that want to stone him. The Bible says he walked through the crowd and just, just went wherever he, wherever he wanted to go. They couldn't touch him. Nothing can stop the plan of God. And that's why it's so important for me personally to be in the will of God and for this church to be in the will of God because it doesn't matter who's in the White House. It doesn't matter what laws they pass. Nothing will stop the will of God and nothing will be able to defeat the plans and purposes that God has. His great commission will be fulfilled and we are determined to be a part of it. And it, we're not going to talk about what the devil's doing. We're going to talk about how hard it is because, listen, if God can't get us through $5 a gallon gas, then these people in this time are really in trouble. You understand what I'm talking about? These two witnesses are going to be living in a time that's much more difficult than we will have. And verse 7 says, now when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Their bodies will lay in the streets of the great city. Now, the great city is Jerusalem, so all this is taking place in the Middle East and in, in Jerusalem, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So that's another indication that's, that it's there in Jerusalem because Jesus was crucified. For three and a half days, Men from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. Can you imagine that? They're just going to let them lay in the streets. And, and I would at one time wonder how in the world could, be, could men be so, um, so heartless. But I see so many heartless things done today that I understand that that is, that is a part of the way humanity has become today. 
For three and a half days, no one's going to bury their bodies. They're going to lay there. That sort of, sort of corresponds to uh, Jesus as well when he was crucified, put in the grave. And then for these three and a half days, everybody in the world is going to celebrate. It says that, that for three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who lived on the earth. Well, how were they tormenting? They were tormenting them by saying that what you're doing is wrong. The way that you're living is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. The, the idols that you're worshiping is wrong. Your sexual immorality is wrong. It, it's wrong. And, and they're, they're, they're declaring these things. And, and these people are, feel like they're tormented because there's someone speaking truth to them. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God enters them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they, they uh, went, up in, in, uh, went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Can you imagine that? You know, the, these two prophets... Over three years, they're prophesying. Nothing can touch them. Fire comes out of their mouth. Somebody tries to come and harm them, fire comes out of their mouth. They at will can declare it's not going to rain, and it doesn't rain. They can, at will can, can bring any plague upon the earth. They at will can turn the waters to blood. This is going on for over three years, and then all of a sudden, the, uh, the beast that's come out of the abyss overpowers them and kills them and people are celebrating in the streets sending sending uh, um, uh, gifts to one another to celebrate but after those three and a half days the breath of God comes into them and they stand up on their street can you imagine the terror that must have come into those people it would scare the bejeebers out of me for sure but sometimes people that are bound with wickedness have no common sense and remember, this is at the end of, of three and a half years. Many have said that the first three and a half years of the tribulation will not be all that bad. And notice there is still a witness of, of Jesus present. But then imagine the change of atmosphere as the enemies of these two witnesses see them being called up uh, by a loud voice. The whole world was rejoicing at, at the death of these two witnesses who had caused trouble by saying what people didn't want to hear. Wor words, they were speaking about their sins, their need to repent, and probably talking about the punishment that was to come. At that very hour when they're taken up, verse 13 says, there was a severe earthquake and, the, and, and a tenth of the city collapsed. That, that's a pretty big earthquake. I heard someone speaking just the other night saying about how earthquakes have intensified. And, he, and, and they, were not, they were not talking about every earthquake. They were talking about earthquakes that were over seven in magnitude. And it is amazing how many have already taken place in the first 10 years of this this, uh, this century that we're in. There's an intensification that's taking place. And, and this time, a tenth of the city will collapse. L listen to this. 7,000 7, people were killed in the earthquake. You know, think about all the people we've already read about. Half of the earth's population is already taken. Half, if, if, if the population were what it were today, four billion people already died. Another 7,000. What, what do you do with all those bodies in one place? Tenth of the cities collapse. 7,000 people die in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. All this is happening in Jerusalem. 
And we understand that because their bodies will line the streets of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So uh, this is happening in Jerusalem. And many say this worship that came at the end of verse 13 was more out of fear than it was repentance. And, you know, um, I, I have to say that whenever I gave my life to, to the Lord, I gave my life out of the Lord because I feared hell. I didn't want to go to hell, right? I heard that Jesus was coming. If the rapture took place, I was going to miss it. At that time, I never got saved until um, after Jason was born. Nancy and I never were not saved when we got married. Uh, we got saved months after Jason got born. We started going to a church, and they preached about the kingdom of God. They preached that hell was real. You know what the reality is? I don't think that many people really think that hell is real anymore. I think many people in the church really don't believe there's going to be a trumpet sound. I think they don't believe that, you know, they, they look at, at everything that's happened. Oh, you know, it's just a phase we're going through. Things are going to get better. There's never been a time like this on planet Earth. Never. Never been a time like this. You, you go back in history and you will never find a time like this in the history of America. This nation is, is in the throes of death if something does not happen very, very quickly. And the reality is that, you know, certainly I love this nation. I, I'm appreciative that I live here. But I understand that sometime this nation is going to cease to exist because everything that we're reading about here is happening in the Middle East. This, this nation is only 240-some years old, very young yet, you know, uh, compared to many, many nations. And we have been blessed, and God has ministered in powerful ways in this nation, but it is a time that we need to run back to God, not turn to God. We need to run. We need to sprint back to God with everything that we have. And we need, we need to pray that God would touch our government leaders as I do every day and um, ask God to give them, give them hearts. Take those callous hearts and, and melt them. You know, as to let us in a song, melt me, mold me, fill me, then use me. And, um, you know, that needs to be our prayer. We need melt my heart. You know, and it's a recite, it, it go, it's over and over again. Once he uses you, you need to let him mold you again, fill you, use you. You know, and if you stay full of everything in the world, there's, there, you know, when empty runs out, there's nothing for God to fill. And we, we saw that in the, in the um, illustration uh, probably a month or two months ago. I preached the message about the woman uh, who had the little jar of oil. She had that little jar of oil that was in her house, and God used it to, uh, you know, she was told to go collect uh, jars from her neighbors, and, and the prophet said, and not a few. And, and there's a lot that she had to pay attention to and be obedient to. He, he, she just didn't go, you know, she could have heard, well, go collect jars from your neighbors. And that could mean I go get two, three, five, but he said, and not a few. Sometimes we do a little bit of what God wants us to do and then wonder why God's not coming through with the blessing that he promised. I'm telling you, if you take a Betty Crocker uh, cake box and do a little bit of what the instructions say, you'll not have a cake, you'll have a mess. And so we, we need to understand that sometimes we have a mess and, and, and wasn't that Saul's problem? He did almost everything God wanted him to do. He was told to go and to kill the, the king of uh, uh, the Amorite, Amorites and to uh, kill all the livestock and all that kind of thing. But he kept some of it. And when, when uh, Samuel came and he, he said, why didn't you do what the Lord told you to do? And he said, but I did. I did. Now why do I hear these sheep? Oh, well, we... Now we, now we start spiritualizing it. We're keeping them for the Lord, to sacrifice to the Lord. 
The Lord don't need sheep. He needs your obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And so that woman had to hear the full instruction. Go get your neighbor's jars, but not just a few. And when she got those jars, her and her, her, and her sons began to pour the oil, pour the oil, give me another jar, pour the oil, fills up, a little bit was in that jar, keeps filling, keeps filling. Finally, she gets to a place, she says, give me another jar. And the sons say to her, there are no more jars. And the oil stopped running when empty was no more. And I'm telling you that we need to let there be a constant flow of, of everything that God gives th to us because whenever we become full, the flow of his oil stops. When we become satisfied with where we are, then the flow of that oil begins to stop. And I want there to be a continual flow, the oil symbolizing the presence of the Holy Spirit, not only in my life, but in this church. And so we, we need to understand that when empty is no more, the oil stops flowing. And we come to a place in uh, every one of our lives that we have to decide that I'm going to continually desire more of what God has for me. I'm not satisfied with what I had yesterday. If there's, if there's something you could be greedy for, it's more of the presence of God. Because the more you get, the more you want. Taste and see that God is good, and he is an awesome God. So we go into verse 14 of chapter 11. It says, the second woe has passed. Talking about the two prophets and uh, the earthquake, all that. The third woe is coming. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. This is, this, God is in control. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. The time has come. You see, everything's going downhill from this point for the world because all the people at this point that are going to be with God, in my opinion, are with him at this point. And, and the full wrath of God is about to be poured out upon the, the whole world. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. This seventh trumpet announces the coming of the king, and there is no turning back at this point. The coming judgments are no longer partial. The, the sealed judgments will be complete, but we're not going to get to those till we get to chapter um, 16. In this next chapter 12, uh, it's talking about, uh, again, God's deliverance and his help for his people. And it's an amazing thing that chapter 12 is just about in the middle of the book of Revelations. And it talks about um, the deliverance of uh, the woman and uh, her son from the dragon that was waiting to destroy them. God is in control, and he unleashes his wrath upon the world that has refused to turn to him. And at this point, there's no escape. All God's people are with him at this point. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a time that... Um, his wrath is going to be poured out when we get to those seal, seal judgments. Already gone through the, um, um, 
um, I'm sorry, the bold judgments. I already talked about the sealed judgments at the beginning, uh, the trumpet judgments, and now the bold judgments are going to be poured out. Uh, there's a prophecy that um, I have. I, I, I need to look it up and, and bring it sometime, given by uh, Rick Riding in, I believe it was 1999, that talked about if America would not completely turn to God, that the wrath of God would come upon America. And part of that prophecy says that uh, the fires of the Civil War would look like nothing compared to what would come upon this nation. You know, if there's only a, a, an awakening, and there have been some, some moves of God in America, Brownsville, Pensacola, Florida. Uh, there have been moves in, in Toronto, Canada, uh, in uh, Smithton, Missouri, pockets of, of revival. And there's even uh, God moving in, in areas of, of the world today and in the United States today. There needs to be a turning not just to, to, to receive from God to fill our churches, but to turn our hearts to him and, and to live in the way that he wants us to live and, and to be holy as he's called us to be holy. And we, we need to get that word back in our vocabulary, to be holy as, as I am holy. That doesn't mean the way we dress. It doesn't mean um, the way we cut our hair, whether we wear jewelry or don't wear jewelry. You know, what it means is that our hearts are totally separated for God. We're, we're given to what God wants to do. So um, we, we thank the Lord for his faithfulness. In Revelation 12, we'll just, we'll just get started, have a couple of minutes here. Revelation 12 and 13 introduce us to three key characters in um, the last half of uh, the tribulation. Uh, we're going to talk about Satan, who's identified as the dragon. There's a false Christ and a false uh, prophet, and so there, there is a false trinity. The, the enemy's always trying to mock anything that God does. And so you're going to have the, uh, uh, the dragon, the false Christ, the false prophet, these three, in sense, are an evil trinity opposing the true God and his people on earth. The beast, the false Christ or antichrist, and the false prophet, uh, you know, we, we understand that they are counterfeits to what, what God has. And, and he seeks to control men by means of deception. The beast is, is, is the future world dictator who promises to solve the pressing problems of, of the nations. The, the false prophet is, uh, is his uh, propaganda minister. And uh, for a time, it appears that the, the trio is succeeding, but then their world empire begins to collapse. The nations assemble for one final battle, the Battle of Armageddon. We'll talk about that later where Jesus appears, and it's, it's game over at that point. The battle's completely done. But, you know, most, a lot of Bible uh, scholars believe that uh, that Antichrist is going to come on the scene, and he's going to bring peace to the Middle East and bring them to a place that they'll sign a peace treaty. And it'll be a temporary treaty because it'll be a seven-year treaty. And... Folks, that is not an impossibility in the day that we're living in today. But in the middle of that seven and a half years, three and a half years, he begins to show his true, true colors and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I don't know the day or the hour. I'm believing the rapture takes place before that. And if that's the case, then the rapture must be getting closer and closer each and every, I, I would say day, but I believe it's every click of the clock that the rapture is coming closer and closer. We could hear the trumpet of God sound. Dead in Christ rise. I can't imagine what that's going to be like. Well, John's vision in chapter 12 opens with two wonders in heaven, uh, and revelations. First, a, a woman given birth to a son. And um, obviously, this son 
is identified as Jesus, symbolic, the symbolic woman. Uh, you know, we can think of Mary, the mother of Jesus, but uh, obviously it's, she's through the nation of Israel who gives birth to this son. The enemy is against uh, the, the nation of Israel. And uh, we'll go into this in more detail as we get into these scriptures. It was through Israel that um, Jesus came into, into the world. In the Old Testament, Israel is often compared to uh, a woman and her, uh, even a woman in travail. And some scriptures in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, the, 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 the world system is compared to um, uh, uh, a harlot in Revelation 17 and the church to the pure bride of Christ in Revelation 19.7. So the son is born and then caught up to the throne of God in Revelation 12.5. And what we've symbolized here is the um, uh, birth of Jesus and his victorious resurrection. And all of that in the middle of Revelation chapter 12 to bring us to remembrance that God is in control and he had a plan from the beginning. And the devil couldn't stop Jesus from being born. He couldn't stop Jesus from coming into power. He couldn't stop him from going to the cross. He couldn't stop him from being resurrected. And he will not stop him from coming back and ruling over the kingdom that he has been promised. And so God is in complete control. That's the satisfaction that we should get from reading the book of Revelation. It also should make us more evangelistic than ever before. The seventh trumpet, which is described in uh, Revelations 11:15, ushers in the bold judgments that we'll talk about in chapters um, uh, 15 and 16. But in chapters 12 to, to 15, John sees the conflict between God and Satan. And that's, what, that's what's going on in chapter 12. There's this conflict, this conflict that, that goes on still today. It's for the souls of men and women, just like yourself, just like our sons and daughters. There's a conflict. God wants everyone to be saved. It's not God's will that any should perish, but the enemies come to rob, to steal, to kill, and destroy. And there's this conflict constantly going on for the souls of men. For the, for the souls of my sons and daughters, for the souls of your sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, grandchildren, uh, husbands, wives. This battle that's going on. Trying, you know, the enemy's trying to get people to question God. God keeps loving people and, and keeps uh, uh, lifting them up. And we need to come to the realization that we just stop questioning God and just start declaring what the Word of God says. God loves me. I, I can say that without reservation. Why can I say it? Because the Bible says that God so loved the world. That means me. He loves me. And, and I can declare that I love him. I'm not perfect, but I love God. I, I love my wife. I'm not a perfect husband, but I love her. I, I'm not a perfect parent, but I love my kids. And, you know, I'm not a perfect pastor, but I love this church. The, the reality is that we don't have to be perfect to love one another. We don't have to be perfect to love God. I can declare without any reservation, I love God. It's not, not because of my works. It's not because of works lest any man should boast. And so there's this great conflict that's going on for the souls. It's been going on. For a long, long time, the conflict between good and evil, even in the Garden of Eden. And the, you know, the conflict that uh, was going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. Don't you, don't you know that, that the, the devil didn't want Jesus going to that cross? He knew that when Jesus died on the cross, everything was over for him. But, and now he, and we're going to find out from this scripture, once he couldn't stop Jesus, who did he begin to make war against? those that were the descendants, Israel, and those that now are the church of the living God. And that's, he couldn't stop Jesus, so his, his intention is to try to stop you, to, to shut your mouth, not to, not to uh, have you give a testimony of the power that's in Jesus. And, uh, you know, it's how we overcome by, by what? Uh, the word of our testimony, the blood of the Lamb. We do not hold back. For even, even at the risk of losing our own lives. 
That's how we overcome the enemy. He, there is a conflict still going on, and we're, we're involved in it. It doesn't matter where you are in, in your walk with the Lord. So in, in, uh, I'll read these few scriptures uh, while we still have time here before we close. In Revelation 12, 1, it says, A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns of, on his head. Uh, you know, John's having this vision. I, you know, it must have been sometimes like a nightmare, some of these things he was seeing. And we talked about the horses that, you know, or the, the locusts that had faces like human beings, hair like a woman, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And here's this that he's saying. The dragon, the great red, red dragon, his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. It's indication that the enemy deceived a third of, his, of God's angels whenever he uh, rebelled against God. He flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour the child the moment it was born. You remember with the account of Jesus being born, Herod did everything that he could to find that child to put him to death. He did not want that child to be born. And, um, and even when he was two or three years old, he sent out a decree that all the male children should be put to death that were two or three years old at that time. That's where the, the welling came, came out from uh, uh, Israel. Okay, can you imagine even that time in, in history that every male child in, in that region that was two to three years old was put to death? You know, I wonder if there were some people that protected their children, if they just went along with whatever the law was. See, there's sometimes that you say no to what the government says, because it was a government decree. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. Of course, that's Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for, for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. I want you to know that God always brings victory to his people. In verses 1 through 6, a reminder of the awesome fact that God, again, is always in control. And this chapter, if it tells us anything, is that in the midst of what has taken place and what is going to take place, God wants us to know, I am in control. And he's reminding us of everything that he's taken care of up to this point. Satan didn't want that child to be born, but there was nothing he could do about it. He didn't want Jesus to go to the cross, but there was nothing he could do about it. He didn't want him to be resurrected, but there was nothing he could do to stop it. And he doesn't want him coming back, and there's nothing he can do to stop that either. And there's nothing he can do to stop a glorious church by being, from, from being uh, taken to be with the Lord as well. The woman represents God's faithful people who have been waiting for the Messiah. The, 12, the, the crown of 12 stars represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And God set the nation of Israel apart for himself, and that nation uh, gave birth to the Messiah. I'm not going to go uh, any further here today, but if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I wouldn't wait another day. I wouldn't wait for another moment to accept him as Lord and Savior. He's coming back soon. We don't know the day or the hour. But you need to have a relationship with the Lord in order to spend eternity with him. And we do that by simply praying this prayer that I'm about to pray. 
If you've never prayed this prayer, I'm encouraging you to pray online or in this house. And um, let us know that you prayed. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you love me. You come to this earth, died on the cross for my sins. You paid the price for me. Today I repent of my sin. I ask you to forgive me of all sin. And from this day forward, I put the rest of my life into your care and your control. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I thank you for this group of people today that have gathered here. As we leave here, let us leave with confidence. Let us leave with the realization that you're in control. Let us leave blessed, knowing that you're going to take care of every situation. And God will thank you. Most of all, let us leave as evangelists, ready to reach out to those that don't know you and, and give them a reason for the hope that we have in this day and hour that we're living in. In Jesus' name we pray. Today as well, we pray, Lord, for um, the, the cake and the ice cream that uh, is provided for those that are celebrating birthdays. Pray, bless it, nourish to our bodies. Just let there be good fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. I believe it's... Uh, set up outside the door here. Uh, you can grab some, take it and leave, or you can set it at the table and enjoy it. Happy birthday, Doris and uh, Art. God bless you guys.